Here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, I'm Amy Goodman, as we turn now to a major development in the case of a jailed Mexican journalist jailed in the United States, uh, who Democracy Now! has been following closely. In El Paso, Texas, on Wednesday, a federal judge issued a 26-page ruling that questioned the Trump administration's detention of Emilio Gutierrez Soto and his son, Oscar, and ordered an August 1st hearing to examine whether immigration officials violated his First Amendment rights. Gutierrez first sought asylum in the U.S. in 2008, after receiving death threats for reporting on alleged corruption of the Mexican military. He's lived here in the U.S. for the past decade. He since won the National Press Club's Freedom of the Press Award. Speaking to Democracy Now! in a jailhouse interview last December, Emilio Gutierrez Soto said deportation would be a death sentence. Well, if we are deported, that obviously implies death. Why? Because ICE under the Department of Homeland Security of the United States, by law, must give a report to the immigration authorities of Mexico and the consulate. And the immigration officials in Mexico have no credibility. It's impossible to trust in them. To the contrary, many of those officials, many personnel at the consulate or immigration service are caught up with organized crime. That's Emilio Gutierrez Soto, uh, interviewed on Democracy Now! from jail. He's been detained since we spoke to him in December. Mexico is one of the most dangerous countries in the world for journalists, with at least seven media workers killed so far this year alone. For more on what this new hearing could mean for Emilio and his son, Oscar, well, we're joined right now uh, by three guests. Oscar also has been jailed since December. Here in New York, Penny Vinitas is with us, Rutgers University law professor who filed the First Amendment challenge in Gutierrez Soto's case. In El Paso, Texas, Eduardo Beckett is with us. He is Emilio's lawyer. And in Washington, D.C., Bill McCarran, the executive director of the National Press Club, which is demanding Emilio be set free. We welcome you all to Democracy Now!, but we begin with Penny Vinitas, right here in the studio. Talk about the significance of this judge's ruling and what it was that you um, applied for relief for? Well, uh, we filed a petition uh, for habeas corpus, which literally, literally means in Latin, uh, we have the body. And we argued that Emilio was detained because he um, had made statements that are critical to uh, the U.S. immigration policy and to the Trump administration. And the timing of his detention is, um, is really what the judge um, focused on. We showed that weeks after Emilio accepted a very prestigious award from the National Press Club and criticized U.S. immigration policy, he was detained. Now, he had been living freely for um, 10 years in the United States, established himself in Las Cruces, New Mexico, a very, very vibrant community, and he was an integral part of that. And he met every single requirement that um, immigration has placed on him. Um, and it was just very uncanny that, after he uh, became public and talked about U.S. immigration policy, that he was detained. We argued that um, his detention by ICE was um, based solely on his statements and his criticism of U.S. immigration policy, and we were able to back that up. Uh, we were able to show that Emilio was on a hit list, basically, um, that was put out uh, right after um, President Trump took office that showed that he was on a list of people to be arrested, even though his immigration case had not yet been decided, even though um, his asylum case had not been adjudicated. He was already on a list of 2,500 people who were uh, targeted for arrest. And the court found that uh, immigration's, uh, the U.S. government's statements that he was um, detained solely because he lost his asylum claim was pretextual, um, because we revealed these emails and we also um, made a strong case that his arrest coincided very, very strongly with political statements that he made. Where did you get this list? List of 2,500 people? We got it through a Freedom of Information Act request um, that the National Press Club did. And um, Emilio's name is just one of 2,500 names of people who were targeted for arrest. It was put out right after the inauguration of President Trump. 
Um, in Judge David Gardarama's 26-page ruling, he wrote, quote, Mr. Gutierrez Soto criticized ICE in a very public manner while accepting a prestigious award from the National Press Club. His arrest occurred only a couple of months later. William McCarran, the executive director of the National Press Club, affirms under oath that an ICE official told him to tone it down during a meeting regarding Mr. Gutierrez Soto, and he interpreted the comment, in the context of the conversation, to mean that the media should stop attracting attention to petitioners' cause. That's the judge's statement. So, Judge Guadarrama ruled this evidence supported your claim that ICE, quote, retaliated against them for asserting their free speech rights. Uh, Bill McCarran, is that right? Joining us from Washington, D.C., head of the National Press Club. Explain exactly what happened, how you felt threatened. So, in the, in the meeting that is referred to in the judge's decision, uh, we were there several days before Christmas asking for Emilio's release. Um, I, I begged for his release. Uh, we knew that they had uh, problems with um, space in the facility, and we thought there was a chance that around Christmas time something might happen. Uh, I'm a pretty calm person, and the meeting was cordial for a while, but um, I became uh, very demonstrative in the meeting. And uh, at some point, the lead counsel for ICE asked, said that we should tone it down and um, that we should, uh, you know, tr and, and it, was, it was in regard to the presentation that we were making at that time uh, um, to ask for his release. But I was there representing uh, media, media interests and the National Press Club. And um, that day, we were headed for a news conference at 1 o'clock. And I'll, I want to return to that in a second, because I think that's important. But um, this message that we should tone it down before our 1 o'clock news conference. It was clear to me that they were trying to fire a shot across the bow that, one, this would not be good for Emilio uh, legally, you know, if we were out there making noise. In other words, uh, you know, keep this all quiet and calm and tone it down, or uh, your guy may have uh, uh, trouble processing through, through our system, right? or he may have some other kind of trouble. It was an intimidation. It was an attempt at intimidation. And this was the lead counsel for, uh, for ICE in the El Paso district. So talk about, Bill, why um, you gave Emilio Gutierrez Soto this major award from the National Press Club. Talk about the yeah. significance of this and his statement before the press club. Sure. Thanks, Amy. Uh, well, he's. We give a, an award every year for press freedom, and, and uh, there's been a terrible problem in Mexico, violence against journalists, and we, th we thought that the writing that uh, Emilio had produced was, was a great example of bravery. Um, he, was, he was calling out uh, military officials who were uh, shaking down people in his town, and um, uh, he, knew, he, he knew this was dangerous, and he took the risk. Uh, at some point, he, the risk was so high that he fled. And so uh, th this was one case, but we, we know there are many cases like this in, in Mexico where journalists were in danger. We thought Emilio was a great example to, to put a spotlight on this problem. And um, Emilio is a, is a very articulate, um, outspoken person. And um, he was in the press club, and I think he was moved to give uh, you know, free reign to his thoughts. And uh, he's very. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation where he spoke about um, spoke about ICE and our policy, and spoke quite a bit about Mexico. Uh, it is not uncommon, I don't think, his his comments at our event. I think they're they're similar to comments he might have made in the Las Cruces area or in other places. He's an outspoken person. So in this case, I think the ICE policy of locking Emilio up is trying to silence him, and I think that's part of what the judge saw as well. And. Uh, we were, we were glad to have him. He's such a wonderful person. You know, no one was concerned about having him have a full set of cutlery, for example. This is not a dangerous person. We were delighted to have him at our black tie event. So when I saw him in December in, in what's essentially a prison, uh, where everything is controlled and where all objects are kept from him, it's really startling. <laughs> um, he's, he's got an important contribution to make to our society as we're trying to solve these very complicated problems at the border. His point of view, 
Mexican journalists' point of view on these matters is very important. And for it to be suppressed in this way uh, is not helpful to solving any of our problems. Uh, and it's, it's cruel and unfair to Emilio. This is award-winning Mexican journalist Emilio Gutierrez Soto and his son in Texas. Um, Gutierrez first sought asylum in the United States in 2008 after receiving the death threats for reporting on alleged corruption in the Mexican military, detained after his asylum appeal was denied. Um, I want to go to a clip of what he said um, to us, uh, speaking through a translator from the for-profit West Texas Detention Center in Sierra Blanca. Um, well, this is what this was a clip of him speaking at the National Press Club. Please, please, do not forget us. Do not forget. Do, do not forget to publish uh, the pain, uh, terrifying uh, situation that I'm in, and and the terrifying manner in which journalists have to work in Mexico. So that was um, Emilio speaking to the National Press Club, because, in fact, he was detained at the time. Is that right, Bill McCarron? At the time that he was uh, speaking at the press club, he was, he was not detained. He, he um, spoke twice to the press club, once in person and once from jail. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we did have him come in via audio, uh, and, that, and that was what the clip you were playing there. Um, and, and he was— uh, uh, he, he was he was calling from jail. Uh, his attorney, Eduardo Beckett, who I think is with us, patched him through. And it was a very moving event. We had many journalists in the room who were uh, there to cover our presentation in the room. We didn't know that we'd be able to get Emilio um, on the phone. And so, yes, just a few days after he had been picked up and, om and, and on his way to being deported, w without outstanding heroic legal work by Eduardo Beckett, uh, Emilio would have been deported. He was he was he was cuffed and on his way. He hmm. and Oscar, and it was only an emergency stay that was able to uh, um, solve this for for the for the moment. And then we're seven months now that he's been uh, in jail. A, a man with no criminal record uh, being held in what is an arbitrary detention. So I want to go to um, Eduardo Beckett, uh, Emilio's lawyer, uh, speaking to us from El Paso. What is the status of his case right now? His immigration case has been reinstated? Yes. Uh, so the Board of Immigration Appeals has reinstated his asylum claim, and we have a hearing coming up on August 16th at 10.30 a.m. here in El Paso, Texas. And we're going before the judge, and we're going to have a status conference and basically talk about how to proceed forward and what kind of evidence uh, the judge will consider. And the judge must consider his entire asylum claim and all the experts and expert opinions and country conditions. And so that's what's going to happen on August 16th, uh, 2018. And yet before that, is this judge's ruling? Explain the significance of this free speech ruling that just came down. I mean, it's a great win. For Emilio, it's a great win for journalists, for free speech, for the First Amendment. Um, so basically, right, we're, we're fighting two cases in two fronts. One is the asylum claim that's before an immigration judge, and then the other uh, case is before a federal district court uh, habeas to get Emilio out. So the significance is, is that on August 1st, if the district court judge is convinced that the that the government retaliated against Emilio on his First Amendment rights, then he shall be released so he can pursue his asylum claim outside the detention center. Like Bill said, you know, it's been seven months uh, of torture, pain, and suffering. He's been spe he spent his 50, 55th birthday behind uh, a jail. Uh, his son also spent his 25th birthday behind a jail cell, you know, and so it's it's pure torture and pain uh, for a father to be in jail with his young son who should be out, you know, going to school, having fun and not in a jail setting just for for seeking asylum. And Penny Venetis, before we wrap this up, the significance of this case for all journalists in the United States. It's critical for all journalists, but it's also critical for all asylum seekers. Right now, we're all focused on asylum seekers being separated from their families. This ruling says that asylum seekers have constitutional rights, and those constitutional rights include the right to free speech and the right to criticize the U.S. government 
from which the um, asylum seekers are seeking asylum. So it really has very, very broad implications. It's a victory, personally, for Emilio and Oscar, is a victory for journalists. Um, but it, most importantly, it's a victory for asylum seekers, because it says that even though um, you are being detained in the United States, you still have the ability to criticize that, and those comments cannot be used against you in your asylum proceedings, and they cannot be used to um, justify detention of you. I want to thank you all for being with us. Penny Venetis, at uh, Rutgers University, law professor. Eduardo Beckett, lawyer for Emilio Gutierrez Soto. Uh, and Bill McCarran, head of the National Press Club, speaking to us from Washington, D.C. In 30 seconds, we're going to review what's happened so far in the family separation cases, um, what's happened to the children, scores of them under five, who still are languishing in jails around the country. And then what about the 3,000? children who are supposed to be reunited by July 26. Stay with us.